Good morning, men, and welcome to the unit review on the Calusa and Tequesta Indians of the Miami River area and of southwest Florida. So let's begin with the Calusa, Florida's ultimate warriors. The early Calusa may have been in South Florida as much as 12,000 years ago. They were descendants of the Paleo Hunters, and as you look on this map right here, you can see that the capital of the Calusa Indians, which means the fierce ones, is pretty much near Cape Coral, uh, Fort Myers, uh, Naples, the 10,000 Islands, and it made it all the way down to Key West. Now even though they traveled to the eastern side of the peninsula, for the most part the area around Miami belonged to the Tequesta tribe. One thing they both had in common was that they were fantastic fishermen and uh, most of their diet came from the protein from the sea. Now there were exceptions of course. We go through their middens and garbage piles, we found out that they were had a tremendous diet. Deer, snake, turtles, uh, you name it, bird eggs, uh, manatees. So this was a very sustained tribe. They were not uh, uh, scavengers. They had a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, a government and they're very quite sophisticated by the time the Spanish came. In fact, the Calusa, who were called the Mound People, and the, the Tequesta were two of the most successful pre-Columbian tribes before Columbus here in the South Florida. Now, the Spanish said that the Calusa were some of the toughest customers that they ever ran into. That they were very healthy, athletic, could swim, and often did swim all the way out to the ships 800 yards away when they're coming in. That they were expert paddlers, and they could run all day long, and they were some of the greatest hunters they ever saw. So this, for the Spanish to compliment the Calusa, uh, now we have no f real physiological proof that they were the tallest tribe in Florida, but there is a tendency to believe that they were over six feet, and the average Florida Indian at that time was between 5'3 and about 5'6. So uh, the Tequesta were not quite as physical as the Calusa. They were a very hardy bunch, all right? And we talked about the idea that when the last Pleistocene or Ice Age receded 10,000 years ago, that a lot of the hunters came into the Florida Peninsula to chase the bigger game. You know, the, the big bison, the mastodon, uh, the future generations of what uh, descendants of elephants, right? And that quite frankly, um, these people had a protein surplus. And Remember we talked about the fact that South Florida was more like a grassland, almost like the Serengetis of East Africa, Tanzania, those areas like that, where the temperature was a constant, constant 70 degrees. Okay. Now, the Calusa, don't confuse them with the Tequesta, because the Tequesta were more of a cave dwelling, if you will, you know, some of the limestone caves that you find along South Bay Shore Drive and those areas like that, the Tequesta were more of a people that lived in the environment as they found it, you know, simple huts and mud and adobe, where the Calusa literally took hundreds and thousands of tons, no exaggeration, to build these mounds to get above the swamps and mangroves of the Everglades. In fact, we talked about the fact that on uh, I-75 and some of the areas leading into uh, Mound Key and Fort Myers and Naples, that the highways were locally built in the 1950s and 60s by tearing apart these mounds to use them as bedrock for the I-75 and other roads that led into southwest Florida. So they were the mound builders, and there's great examples of it still in Estero Bay and in Lee County. You know, we talked about the fact that uh, Southwest Florida was the capital of the Calusa. And the, the big mystery is because they were such a sea-bound people with their homemade canoes and burnt-out uh, uh, sailing vessels, that they may have been traded, they may have actually traded with the Carib Indians of Cuba. 
and that would be quite an amazing thing if they did. So they were very, uh, very mobile people, and uh, they never went into the interior of the Everglades per se, but they did go into the interior far enough where their villages would not be sighted by enemies. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't have fishing villages along the coast, because they did. But their big cultural centers are a little bit into the interior on the mounds hidden by the mangroves of the Everglades. And quite frankly, the river system back there is so complicated that if you were a predator or an enemy of the Calusa, and there weren't many, you'd have a very difficult time finding your way in there to find the cities. We talked about the fact that they, uh, we found many of these masks, these hand-carved masks by artists that were pre-metallic, no metal, using only shells and pieces of wood, carved these fantastic hunting masks and ceremonial masks. And in the slide on the right, we can see that the physiology of the Calusa is well represented by this. Here's a prime example of the mound. Now, we also talked about the fact that we see this insignia a lot, the four corners, the cross inside the circle. We're still trying to crack the codes on this. But as you see, there is a hierarchy of society here, a division of labor. We have hunters, we have fishermen, we have people that build boats, we have the priest class, which were also the astronomer class, we have people that are doing construction, right? So this was a very well-ordered, sophisticated society that had been around for over 12,000 years before the arrival of Juan Ponce Leon in the early 1500s. Marco Island, we talked about the fertility symbol that was half of a panther and half of a female and uh, quite a, an impressive find in 1972 to come up with that. Now the big question on the test will be this. We still don't believe that the Calusa were tattooed. For many, many years that was the mythology that the Calusa were tattooed. We think that they used berries and other types of paint for war and for ceremonial things, but for a long, long time we, we thought the Calusa used uh, porcupine quills and uh, shark's teeth and uh, things like that to, to make homemade tattoos. Well, I'm going to fall on the side of the argument with the anthropologists that it was paint, but we don't know yet. But one thing is for sure, these guys are the manufacturers of the greatest canoes possible. The French artists, uh, uh, many French artists who came in Florida a little bit later, right? They're talking about the idea that some of these canoes could hold up to 10 to 12 people. That's impressive. And as being a man of the sea, I know that if your boat is not worthy and the weather changes and you start getting that water, start stacking on top of each other, you'll find out how stable your boat really is. Okay? This is one of the local Calusa fishing villages. We talked about how the children make these catch nets. They put them at the mouth of the rivers, and they catch everything when the tide goes out, from, from little pinfish and catfish all the way up to dolphin. All right. So we uh, classic example of Calusa warriors. This was a good, good video. Remember, we talked about the idea of stratigraphy, stratigraphy. When anthropologists go through different layers of dirt and levels of things, it's almost an archaeological record about how they lived. You know, several generations piled on top of each other. You know, men, that's not unusual in archaeology because when they do digs in Jerusalem, apparently there were actually seven separate cities of Jerusalem's, different versions, stacked on top of each other. And I know that there were five levels of Rome. You know, and right now I think there's maybe two or three levels of Miami. So the stratigraphy is when you go to the layers and a dig and you look for clues, right? And sometimes the clues can be different types of artifacts found there, middens, the color of the dirt. So it is an incredible, almost if you will, almost like a criminal investigation. You're looking at a crime scene. But this is not a crime scene per se. This is a historical record. Well, OB, you shouldn't use the word historical because history only means when it's written down. And you're right. You're absolutely right. These people were prehistorical because they had no written records 
only the idea of storytelling, the oral traditions. Now this is on the test for sure. They were very spiritual people. And remember they believed that a man had three souls. You could see one in the pupil of his eye. Intriguing. One in a reflection in a pond of water, a body of water, and one in a shadow. And one thing that's for sure, your shadow and my shadow are unique and no one will ever cast that shadow again. We also know that Calusa believed in avatars and that the turkey buzzard and the owl were messengers from the spirit world. All right, that's the mouth of the Miami River. We talked about the fact that there's that symbol again, and this was actually the back of a chair found in a dig near Fort Myers that may have been the throne of one of the CKs or kings. Now this is conch shells. Usually you think about Calusa, and you should. This is a artistic interpretation. So this is kind of a mixture of both Calusa and Tequesta. There's the Freedom Tower, and this is the Miami River. So if you're on the Miami side, that is Tequesta, not the warrior class of the Calusa. The Tequesta were mostly peaceful fishermen. The Calusa were warriors, and the Calusa were travelers. The Tequesta pretty much hung around the areas of the Miami River, and on occasion made it all the way down to Key Largo. All right, okay. René de Loudinaire, the French artist from a little bit later, made this wood carving of the Florida, native Florida Paleo Indians, their descendants, Calusa, traveling in these amazingly long, homemade dugout canoes. And as you can see here, even though there's a lot of vegetables, right, they are primarily not farmers, they are hunters, and they primarily live on fish. But the occasional deer is, and turkey is also tasty too. The question will come up, human sacrifice and cannibalism? Yes, we believe the Calusa on occasion did do this. Not like the Aztecs, who were offering sacrifices to the sun god and the rain god on an regular basis. We believe the Calusa only did this on high sacred days and we do not know if they were using prisoners or who the victims were, we're only assuming that they were uh, prisoners from other tribes. So the question comes up about cannibalism and human sacrifice? We're going to say yes. We talked about the, how the Tequesta actually used and hunted whales by driving wooden pegs into their blowholes, dragging the whales and manatees ashore. And it's interesting because we talked about the idea how respectful they were. We keep finding in the Tequesta areas of the Miami River these homemade coffins that always point from north to south. And inside these homemade little coffins are the bones of the manatees and the whales very reverently and respectfully laid in there so it's as if they actually prayed over the animal to thank him for his sacrifice to sustain the tribe. And on the right is another statue of the Tequestas in the Miami River. Okay, uh, interesting site, the Cutler Fossil Site, down by 168th, I believe it is. And inside that, that sinkhole many, many years ago, in 1985, archeologists found the remains of human bones and they also found two skulls. And in those skulls were actually preserved DNA material. And that cold, murky, almost, you know, spring water, right? This may have been an aquifer, a uh, sinkhole, we don't know. But down there we found the amazing bones of the gigantic elephants that walked in South Florida, armadillo, right? Many, many. I've been there, men. I've been there. They found a ton of artifacts, but it was very exciting that they were actually able to find, preserved in the kind of the clear, murky, muddy water down there of the sinkhole, actually brain material. And it was able to be analyzed, and they actually had some DNA. It was a fantastic, fantastic site. One thing I learned about the, the, the Dade County Archaeological Site called 2001 is I did not know that there were dire wolves in Florida. A dire wolf is like a wolf on uh, steroids. A very, very, shall we say, lean 
but slightly bigger wolf than we have today, but very muscular. Okay, what became of the Calusa? Well, many of them did actually survive the smallpox and measles brought by the Spanish, but most of them, we believe, right, were wiped out not only by disease, but were sold into slavery, right? Not only the English turned these people into slaves, but the last of the remaining Calusa were actually brought into Cuba. And at that point, the record of what happened to them is lost, which is kind of unusual because the Spanish keep such great records, but we were unable to find anything about the demise of these fantastic people of Southwest Florida. So disease and slavery. Smallpox was terrible, man. Smallpox may have wiped out in North America somewhere between 87 to 90, 95% of the native population because they were geographically isolated for so long they had no immunity to these new diseases where the explorers were used to it. The Africans were used to it because Africa and Europe are close together. That's one of the reasons that slavery turned to Africans and not Native Americans because Africans seem to survive European diseases better, probably because they had exposure to these diseases and could work up an immunity for, I mean, that went on for hundreds of years. All right. And last but not least, the Calusa did not do well in converting into Christianity. All right. No matter where the Spanish tried to establish their missions, right, they, there was a heavy toll. And even though we don't have a lot of records of the violence, we do know that the Native Americans resisted the change of their religion. And quite frankly, right, they did not make good Christians. So if you got a, you volunteered or were assigned to go to Florida or Alabama or Georgia, right, uh, quite frankly, you were taking your life into your hands. So if it comes up on the test, the Calusa were very, very resilient in keeping their faith. And I'm not saying some of them didn't convert to Christianity, but I'm just saying it was a very tough mission, very tough mission to convert the nations. And then slowly but surely, we lose a record of them. And right around 1760, if I remember correctly, the record of the Calusas that were taken out of Florida just simply seems to disappear. Again, did the Tequesta and Calusa use tattoos? I don't know, but I find it interesting that the same symbols show up over and over again. The turkey buzzard, there he is. He looks east and he looks west. Avatar from the spirit world. All right. So we're going to get into the Seminoles in a future lecture. We talked about the Tequesta tribe with uh, Bob Carr. And we had a few questions we went over, right? And quite frankly, I think that this will be an easy test for you. Uh, it's got a high interest, right? And if you looked at these questions and paid attention to the uh, lecture, you're going to be in good shape. Okay. So this is OB signing off. Hope you have a wonderful morning. And uh, I know you're going to do well on the examination. As always, it's a pleasure, and I thank you for watching this video.